There's going to be a massive tectonic upheavals in the auto industry coming as soon as next year with Tesla again coming out as a big winner. Many people and perhaps some of these legacy automakers don't yet realize that the U.S. government is stepping in to make major changes. First, ex-President Trump announced that if he is elected, he'll put a 100% tariff on every car coming into the United States across the Mexican border. Tesla won't be affected by this as they currently don't produce any cars in Mexico. This explains why Tesla stopped their gig in Mexico project. Or we don't know exactly what they're doing, but they've at least slowed that down. But Ford and GM make a lot of cars there, though. In Q2 2024, 47% of Ford's EV sales and 35% of GM's were from factories in Mexico. And to make matters worse, the U.S. Commerce Department is telling Ford and GM to be prepared to stop car imports built in China as new rules are being proposed to prohibit Chinese software and hardware on American roads. And finally, it looks like that the last remaining roadblock for electric vehicles is affordability. Range anxiety? No longer a major concern. as a charging infrastructure has continued to be built out. To help me walk through all of this with me is Brian White. Uh, he's the host of his own YouTube channel called Futuraza. Thank you, Brian. This is so insane. You know, uh, are we going to stop all imports of all everything? Uh, there's some obstacles. Even if you like the idea, it's going to be difficult to implement. And that's what we'll discuss. Yeah. So you're one of the best people to talk to about this today because you are one of the few who really follow closely uh, all the manufacturers and what they're building in which countries specifically, all the factories uh, we've talked about before, you have this weird obsession with factories. <laughs> I do. I do. Um, the little weird. kid who likes to watch the construction trucks go by, I guess. Yeah. And then you know that uh, how fast they're making cars, how many on that. That's great. So let's start off with... Um, this first story here. So Trump has been announcing that he will put a 100% tariff on every car coming into the U.S. across the Mexican border if he wins a presidential uh, election. Now, Trump, uh, currently, this is going to affect Ford and GM the most. Tesla does not currently produce any cars in Mexico. So I want to talk to you about Giga Mexico factory plans because, of course, you and I, we were following that like a hawk. We thought it was about to happen. There was even one weekend, remember, the governor or the mayor came out and said, it's happening this Monday. <laughs> they <laughs> said happened. Sunday, which is why I was very skeptical. <laughs> that's right. Uh, so, but if this actually happens, it's Ford and GM that's going to be hit, hit the most. They make the most cars there, both ICE and EVs. In terms of their EVs, 47% of them uh, that they sell in the U.S. were vehicles manufactured in Mexico and then imported for GM, 35%. And of course, they also make ICE cars there as well. So we'll put 100% tariff on every single car coming across the border. The only way they'll get rid of that tariff, though, is they if, if people can get rid of that, if they want to build a plant right here in the United States. And that is exactly what Tesla's doing. People don't realize the most American-made car is Tesla's yep. because they're all done. 95% or whatever percentage of supply chain is also in the U.S., Every Tesla currently sold in America is built in America. Now, uh, Sawyer also pointed out, though, that this, this uh, U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement signed by Trump in January 2020, it prohibits the leverage of tariffs on a range of goods. So if he wants to add the 100% tariff, it needs to have uh, repeal that agreement that would be required action by the Congress. What do you think about this? So that's the exact thing. When you have a trade, a trade agreement is a sign of stability. Uh, it says we can predict the future, we can plan accordingly, we can tell our industry to, to behave accordingly. Uh, it's all about long-term security. This is, the USMCA is a brand new deal. It's less than, you know, it's only four years old. So that is, in terms of trade agreements, very, very new. If he wants to blow it up and say we're not going to be part of it, we want a new one, he can try that. But a trade agreement is bilateral or multilateral. It's however many parties are in it. I guess in the in the case of the USMCA, it's trilateral and everyone has to agree to it. Mexico's not going to agree to a one-sided deal that just punishes them. Why would they, what would they get out of it? Now they could just say, we're withdrawing from the trade agreement entirely and we're not going to have any trade agreements. And then Mexico would retaliate with tariffs on U.S. cotton. Mexico is the buyer, the largest buyer of U.S. cotton, and U.S. is the largest producer of cotton in the world. This would be a problem. This would be a huge problem for our farmers. Trade wars are not a good idea. And 100% tariffs, like you said, Ford only has three electric models. The Mach-E is made in Mexico. 
The E Transit's made in Kansas. The Lightning's made in Detroit. Great. So two out of three made in the U.S. But the biggest seller of the three is made in Mexico. This is, what are you doing to your own companies when you say, this is a deal, this is lasting, and then four years later, you blow it up? That's crazy. And and wouldn't these uh, Ford and GM who decided to build factories in Mexico, and of course, even Tesla was decided to build Mexico, is because there's going to be benefits. Uh, right. Lower cost, probably. There's Mexico already has a lo- um, quite a number of supply chain built there because GM and Ford and others are there. So it's this, um, it makes sense. I like the idea of build in America, factories in America, but what's going to happen to Ford and GM? They're going to have to um, raise prices or, you know, costs are going to go up and they're already losing money, especially on the electric vehicles. Yeah. Uh, BMW 3 and 5 series are made in Mexico. They've got the Volkswagen plant, the Mazda plant, Nissan, Honda, Chrysler. All these factories are already in Mexico and the supply chain built up around them to support those volumes is already there. So it was a logical choice for Ford and GM to put plants there. Um, The expertise exists, the supply chain exists, and the trade deal is brand new. Surely this is secure, Uh, but maybe it isn't. Okay. And I think and I think you're right. Congress would have to Congress would absolutely have to approve it. And I think Congress would be very hesitant to do to do so because this would be catastrophic for our reputation as a stable nation. Okay. So this is the interesting thing. Okay. Ford and GM, they're already struggling. They're trying to make their ways in. Here comes this potential tariff on Mexico. Good thing Tesla decided not to move forward with Giga Mexico. Now we kind of know maybe why. Uh, even BYD. Remember, we did a show one time. The president Stella Chan, uh, Stella um, Lee, or Stella Chan. I can't remember her last name. And she came out and said that um, the president of BYD for America said we are not going to build Mexico until we know what happens with the election. She was mm-hmm. warned that months ago. Anyways, now we know why Giga Mexico might have been scrapped. It, that could be one reason. The other reason it, it could, could have been, be, yeah. yeah, it could be one reason. But I would say that Giga Mexico was supposed to have a groundbreaking before this uncertainty arose, before this discussion began. Yeah. I think Giga Mexico's on a delay because something's going to happen on ten ten, and we don't yeah. know what it is. We can't exactly. see it. Yeah, it was the it was the decision to change the uh, the plan for unbox model and maybe the robo taxi. Uh, uh, creating that lower price car, switching it. Okay, all that change. Um, so you got this issue with Mexico, but the problem is there's also an issue with China and Ford and GM are big importers of cars from China. So Ford and GM might be required to stop imports from China. Tesla makes their cars in the US to sell in the US. Tesla makes their cars in China to sell in China. I think they also import to Canada, but They've stopped yes. doing that ever since Canada yes. said they're going to have a uh, uh, tariff, but they're not going to be affected. Ford and GM, though, what are they going to do? So what's happening is there's new rules by the U.S. Commerce Department, and it's going to affect automakers selling or building vehicles in the U.S., including the big three, GM, Ford, and Stellantis. The Commerce Department proposed prohibiting, like this is prohibiting, any kind of Chinese software and hardware, right? They don't want them in American roads, national security concerns. Um, so any car made in China by any automakers, including the these guys that we just said, right? GM builds a Buick Envision while Ford assembles the Lincoln Nautilus in China. So at this point, any vehicle that's manufactured in China, sold in the U.S., would fall within the prohibitions. And um, yeah, that you know, moving forward, producing vehicles in the U.S. would need to be shut down in China and moved elsewhere. And she noted that moving forward, producing vehicles for the U.S. market, yeah, if, if it's coming from those guys, would be shut down. So it looks like software prohibitions will take effect in 2027 model year units. It's uh, coming up very quickly here, a couple of years. The hardware ban will be effective for 2030 model year units. So it's the software first and then hardware by 2030, starting June, January 2029. And they're giving people time to talk about this. Um yeah, this is another thing these guys have to worry about. And it makes sense. We're looking at the U.S. trying to ban TikTok because uh, of privacy concerns. Of, of and Privacy is national security. If a general's son or daughter has TikTok on their phone while they're wandering the base, is that a privacy concern? Potentially. If their vehicle has cameras all around it, you know, in 
in the book 1984, everyone was worried, oh my gosh, the government's going to install surveillance everywhere. There's going to be spy devices that uh, people will sneak around. And now everyone says, hey, spy device, can cats eat <laughs> flapjacks? <laughs> so uh, I don't know. It, it never occurred to me that I would be the one paying for my own spy device and the connectivity and giving away my data so freely. So it's a concern. And what we've seen is China's already done this. They don't want U.S cars with those cameras us ga data gathering tesla as you know is required to sequester their data in china and uh, we had a whole show about that it's understandable that you can still get control arms from china or blinkers probably from china if they're not too smart but you can hide a chip in anything electronic that can have a whole lot of capacity yeah okay oh man so Another angle on the same news, this is coming from automotive news from, you know, China kind of perspective, and they say the same thing, right? GM Ford would be forced to halt imports, but I thought this was interesting down here. It says the rule would also affect, if you think about this, right, other automakers selling or building vehicles in the U.S., such as Volvo and BYD. So obviously, even Chinese car companies trying to, you know, invade the U.S., well, they're going to have to deal with a couple of things. There's going to be tariffs. On the Chinese car companies, but then there will be also software restrictions. That's the big one. Because you look at a company like Polestar, who's already opened their factory in the US, are yeah. they about to be told that, yeah, you can build the car, but you can't use any Chinese IP on it? You can't use any of the software mm -hmm. developed in China in your Polestar. What are they supposed to do? Who are they what supposed are you, to get it from? Oh, I, I wonder what they're <clears throat> supposed to do. Who are they going to get it from? They're going to partner with Tesla. Because, They'll well, have to. no, but it does Tesla have all the information needed to integrate it into their vehicle? Certainly not. And then there's going to be running changes and there's going to be obstacles. Uh, getting Getting software to work right on a car is a monumental task, as we've seen. Nobody else does it as well as them. Rivian, who's very small and has no right to be any good at it, is almost as good as Tesla. And the legacy guys are just terrible. So getting someone else's software to work on your car can be a nightmare. I think that's what's going to happen. All right. So we'll have to work with them to better understand their supply chain. These are the US, you know, car company, uh, anybody who wants to go sell in the US. Software will be prohibited if they were developed by a team of Chinese employees in that country for a Chinese automaker. Software would likely be allowed if it were developed by Chinese employees working in another country for a non-Chinese company. Okay. So four That's... Chinese vehicle models are sold in the US, including the Polestar and Volvo's 90 Pulsar and Volvo. You just talked about them. Affiliates mm -hmm. of Chinese automaker Geely said expects companies like Volvo will meet with the Commerce Department, work with us to figure out what they need to do. So, yeah. It's going to be tricky. And then the question is does it extend to the BYD buses made in Los Angeles? Right. Maybe. Uh, those are camera covered connected devices. So, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's interesting. Uh, just tremendous amount of, what do they call this, headwinds um, for yes. the automakers. There's It's coming from everywhere, right? They can't even make yes. a profitable vehicle. Now they have to build new plants in the U.S. Now they have to change, figure out how they're going to get the software that's not from their reliant on China. So unless the U.S. Has backs down and says, no, because we don't want to kill our automakers, you know, um, yeah, we'll need to figure out what happens. Yeah. So again, people are not realizing you know, they, just too many things. I don't think they can survive. Just yet another thing to think about. So can electric vehicles be sold? And we, we've seen that in tremendous exponential growth. Yes, last year has been slower growth because of the economies in both China and the US, but it's still growth. So one of the two biggest issues, one is affordability and one is range anxiety. And these experts are saying now that it's still, it's really just affordability at this point. Range anxiety is no longer a concern. So this is the panel from Automotive News. And what they said was range anxiety, experts believe it is subsiding because of China, the cha charging infrastructure is building out. I think I saw a stat that uh, superchargers in the U.S. is now 65,000 and it was double what it was just a couple of years ago in 2022. So it's growing so quickly. 
And um, the big hindrance constraining electric vehicle sales remains affordability. A Feldman Automotive Group, we're seeing a ton of people flock to them when they can afford them. Uh, FV EVs, when the price and payment's there, they're not afraid to buy them. The biggest issue in our industry is affordability. Uh, quick comments on that. The first thing to address is, is, there, is range anxiety real? I know a lot of buyers who feel it is. Um, but increasingly, they know someone who has one, and that's always the first question people get is, what's your range? How far can you yeah. go? Is it a problem? Yeah. And the more people they know who say, yeah, I don't even think about it. I always leave on, on a full state of charge, whatever state that is to me, 80% in my case. I don't even think about it. And then, uh, so, and then when you're actually out using it, it's getting better. The supercharger network is opening to more uh, drivers of other brands. Had a chance to talk with a gentleman uh, with a Hummer at a supercharger over the weekend, uh, and he uh, <clears throat> he said it doesn't uh, it doesn't work as well as it does on his Tesla, but it works. But his Hummer on the supercharger network works better than it does on Electrify America, so it is an improvement, even if a marginal one. Um, charging is getting better. It is getting easier, but affordability is the real question and it is getting better, but slowly the EV nine is a beautiful vehicle. It's got seven seats. It is a full size SUV. It is comfortable in the third row, the most comfortable of any of the SUVs I've seen, except maybe the model X, but, uh, I don't, I've never been in the third row of that. So I can't say how tight it is. Uh, but it's 70 grand and it's made in Korea. So you, you're not going to get the incentive on it unless you do a lease. And a lot of people won't do leases. 70 grand is a whole lot of car for that price. Just spend another $8 and get a Model X. Uh, so it is improving. The prices will continue coming down. Their processes and procedures are getting better. The cost of batteries is improving and uh, the economies of scale are coming online. So, yeah. yeah. So this concern about range anxiety, I mean, there's many different sub worlds to that, right? So it's not just one thing, right? So there's, is there a range anxiety if you're trying to buy a Tesla? No, there's not so really. many superchargers out there. We've got friends that have driven across the country in the regular, uh, not even the lo long range, just the regular cars. And they're able to just go anywhere they want to go. My daughter was asking me, Hey, if we drive the car from Seattle to LA, I'm worried. And she goes, I said, no, there, there's no issues there at all. But if you are worried about range anxiety, if you buy any other car, that is absolutely true. Um, there, there's, and, and then also where do you live? If you live in a rural area, this, this probably true. There's pockets, but now we're seeing all of the other EVs have adopted the electric um, supercharger. And just this year, uh, what in the last month or two, we've reported at least four, uh, comp companies actually building in the super Tesla supercharger uh, port right there, uh, right in their car. So right. this is no longer going to be a concern. Yeah. The R3, uh, which I saw at the Everything Electric show in BC, had a NAX connector port on it. And it is filling out. There are definitely, like you said, pockets where it's still not as good as it could be. Uh, but for those who charge at home, it's not always an issue. And yeah, affor affordability is coming. But in terms of charging, unless you're buying a Mazda MX-30, uh, which the Tesla short shorts historian pointed out five years ago, that was the next Tesla killer. So and also, oh. yeah, you had some buddies of yours, right? Bearded Tesla and others who actually <clears throat> went to the Arctic Circle. Um, Arctic Ocean, all and, the way and, to the ocean. And they were able to do it. That was the point, right? To show that, hey, I can take my Teslas and drive all the way up there. So. That's a very isolated case. So let's take a more realistic case. Jan from Tesla Fix drove me from Switzerland through Germany to Austria in a rear wheel drive Model 3. And we had no range anxiety. It there just, it just works. So just to continue the article here, the average transaction price, so affordability is the key issue now. Uh, for any new, for new vehicles, $48,000. That's the problem. Uh, according to Kelly Blue Book Daily, Daily. So it's not just um, EVs, it's also ICE cars. It marked the 11th consecutive month that average transaction price fell compared with the same month year over year. So it's at least falling. But the average transaction price for an EV, okay, is 56,000. It was marginally higher than July, suggesting EV price declines are slowing. The other reason why though, is that many co companies, if they're gonna create an EV, they go high end. 
Right. Um, you're you're looking large. at your Lucids, your Rivians, your yeah. there are brands there are many brands that yeah. don't have any models below fifty. The only reason it's that as low as it is is because of the three and Y. And and the reason why is because it's easier to create a larger battery uh, yeah. for larger vehicles. And then, but now that's coming down quickly. And then of course, when Tesla introduces more affordable vehicles. So this is not necessarily stop consumers from purchasing EVs. Their sales rose 11% year over year in the second quarter, uh, reaching a record high volume of 330,000. Total EV sales in the second quarter was 23% higher than the first quarter. So as much as hardware challenge, challenges exist, automakers trying to squeeze better efficiency, forming new charging networks to alleviate range concerns, the challenge can be psychological. Yeah, you have yeah, to absolutely. get over that hump. You know, when and, you just see we 250 were, miles. You go, and by the way, we were talking about that before. Oh, EV sales are dying. Really? Because this says they're up. Yeah. And, and the key is selling to customers who charge in their garage overnight. So there's that pocket too. The people who don't have garages and the ones who do. If you have a garage, not a concern. If you don't have a garage, you have to look at, you know, how are you going to do this? Um, okay. So I did have a video that came out this week where I showed several articles from different countries I think just England and Ireland, where they were talking to people for whom an EV was more expensive than a gas car because they didn't have home charging and public charging where they lived was egregiously high, like a mm. dollar a kilowatt. Mm. Uh, so they, but that, but if you can plug in at home, even on a 110, just an extension cord, you're, it's going to be so much cheaper than putting gas in your dyno burner. Right. Good. Thank you so much, uh, Brian. Appreciate you. Check him out. Go to his, uh, you know, X account at Futuraza. Go check out his YouTube account, Futuraza. He rebranded. He used to be called My Tesla Weekend. I'm very happy now um, with this new brand. Lots more. Uh, Futuraza, it's a lot more travel that you do. You go all over the world. Um, go where the future is. <laughs> I went. I went to the to the not site of not Giga Te uh, Mexico to see the lack of construction. It was interesting. <laughs> it was. You saw it for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that video. Thank you so much, Brian. Check him out. Talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.